Hi. Um, it would be great if someone could um, volunteer. Please. Okay, um, so I see um, a sign from Ninaku Oberholzer. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I just want to check, um, Tanya, will you be speaking for 15 minutes so I can time? Um, I'm going to try and speak for less than 15, uh, Ninaku, but I, at the moment, I can only see my PowerPoint presentation, so I can't even see you. I can hear you, luckily, and I hope you can hear me. So I think what I'm going to ask you, um, Nina, if I get close to like 12 minutes or so, you just interrupt me, even if I'm busy speaking, because I simply cannot see anyone else except my PowerPoint. And I think this, I suppose this is how this technology works. And then um, after that, um, when I'm finished talking and, and we go over to the discussion, I'll just ask you or whoever to put the questions that I sent through on the screen, but I'll get to that when I'm finished. So please time me, give me about 12 minutes because I want to leave room for lots of discussion. Okay, will do. Okay, so does that mean I can start? Yes, please start. Thank you so much. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I can't see how many of you are there today, but it is my privilege to have this brief introduction to ecofeminism. And um, I think at the end of my very short presentation, I'm going to put a bunch of questions on the screen, which uh, came to my mind when I was preparing this very short introduction, um, simply because I'm wondering, and I would like to hear your thoughts, I'm wondering how we are thinking about ecofeminism today. I'm wondering how we are thinking about the term. What does it mean to be an ecofeminist in your specific context? What does it mean in my context? And um, as I said when I introduced this short theme, I'm going from the perspective of uh, guardians of the future. Uh, I've seen many times now that uh, people are wearing T-shirts and it says the future is female. And I always wonder if when I see those T-shirts, because I've also got one, and I also wonder, but what does it mean in terms of, is it our duty? Is it our responsibility? How are those connections made? Um, and this is something of the aspects that I will be looking at uh, in this presentation. So I have got four main questions. And the first one is, what are we actually talking about when we are talking about the term ecofeminism? So it's a term, it's a study field, but it's also specifically very much a movement. And it was coined in 1974 by a French feminist, and my French pronunciation is not very good, I'm sorry uh, in advance, François de Aubonne. And um, it was connected to the whole idea of women's potential to bring about ecological change. And I guess that would be my question to you as well. What is women's potential to bring about ecological change? So ecofeminism is regarded as a branch of the women's movement. There are many different branches. And it's basically looking at two sub aspects which are very much connected. This branch of the women's movement is what I'm about what I name or describe as the two dominations. So ecofeminism as a branch of women's movements focus on the domination of women and the domination of nature, and specifically how these two intersect. Now, previously, it was mostly about um, a focus on andro, uh, anthropocentrism, which we heard when we heard um, the response to the first keynote. But then the focus gradually shift, uh, shifted to also focusing on the androcentrism at the heart of the ecological crisis. So basically saying, but why are we in this predicament? What led to this predicament in terms of the ecological crisis? And how um, are the, dom the domination of women and the domination or the oppression of nature connected? So that is how these two things started out. And there I've got a quote by Rosemary Radford Ruther, one of the ecofeminists I will be gradually focusing on. And she said, ecofeminist movements, because there are multiple, I want to focus on that right from the start, refer to a complex reality of how women and nature have been exploited both by their own societies and includes how women and nature have been exploited by colonizing powers. 
how women function as the mediators of nature's benefits to their families and may be caretakers of nature in this context. And that's why I'm using the word guardian, because does guardian in this context mean that it is women's duty or that women are better suited? Does it mean both of those things? Do Does it mean something else? So just briefly, um, uh, colleagues, how far have we come? 1962 in America, Rachel Carson published her book Silent Spring, which focused on the impact of pesticides. 1973, women from the Chipka movement protested deforestation. 1977, the Green Belt movement initiated by Wangari Matai, um, which also in 20, 2004 won the first uh, Nobel, well, the, she was the first woman from Africa working on sustainable development that won the Nobel Peace Prize for that. 1980, you can see their first eco-feminist conference. In 1985, uh, the Mothers a Mill project um, uh, in, 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 on the river, uh, on the bank of the river. And I can't remember which bank of the river it is now, if you just give me a moment. Um, it's, um, I'll, I'll get to that. It was very much focused on how some of the pesticides got themselves into the genes and the biology, uh, and that affected uh, the way that women were nursing their babies. Then we have in 1992 and 1995 those major achievements in the declarations. And in 2011, there was um, a big protest in South Africa during the UN Climate Conference. Uh, where women from women farmers from 10 South African countries marched at the UN Climate Conference in Durban. The point of all of this, you see there's a lot of diversity. It does not come only from one place. And that basically leads me to the rest of my questions. Is this um, eco, the term ecofeminism, is it about one thing? Is it about many things? And how do we sort of get connected in terms of the f uh, different diversities that we have and the different contexts that we have when we talk about this and the challenge? So let's continue. Are we saying the same thing? So then the right hand side, I've got um, a very famous uh, Kenyan uh, Wangari Matai, and then it, uh, just below her, um, Vandana Shiva, and just below her, Rosemary Radford Ruther. And there are many others as well. I'm just taking them briefly as representatives of our different context. So there's a diversity of approaches when it comes to ecofeminism, which is mostly determined by one's interests and the way that you are affected by ecological challenges and ecological degradation. So the ask, there you see the question again. So the one approach is a cultural symbolic approach, which is like almost an ideological superstructure, which focuses on the appreciation and the critique of the woman nature connection. In other words, women are natural nurturers, etc. Um, but it also critiques that connection. Those are the two main things that from a cultural symbolic perspective, it does critique. But also part of this cultural symbolic perspective is an essentialist perspective, which links women to nature and the spirituality and the indigenous roots. And that can be both positive and negative. There's also a socioeconomic approach, which is more about the analysis of how women's bodies and labor are utilized as a type of a superstructure for creating wealth. So women's bodies or labor are used to create wealth, but a wealth that they cannot participate in and that they are not the beneficiaries of. And this acknowledges and, uh, and analyzes race and class hierarchy. So it focuses on how race and class influences this woman nature nexus in a different way than from the cultural symbolical perspective. Then you've also got this uh, cultural spiritual ecofeminism of which Starhawk, the Native American woman, is uh, a proponent. And this um, perspective utilizes religion and spirituality very much, both in a positive and a negative way. And then from the, from the perspective of Andana Shiva, she focuses very much on an anti-essentialist uh, perspective where she critiques um, the possible dangers of connecting um, a woman and nature from a religious or a spiritual perspective because she maintains that some aspects of that religion actually enforce negative stereotypes. So let's continue. 
So what does it mean to be an eco-feminist in your context? I think that's for me the main challenge and the question of today's brief introduction. Looking at all these different approaches, what does it mean to be an eco-feminist in your context? What are your challenges? What are the perspectives you bring to the table? How is the culture and religion and your indigenous roots affecting your situation? Uh, how is it different or the same than other women's? So then my, oh, my question is, and I'm almost nearing the end, can we work together? Rosemary Radford Ruther in her book that was written almost 25 years ago makes a very strong distinction between North and South ecofeminism. I'm wondering if we are making those distinctions today, um, and I think we are, but I'm wondering how would we describe those type of distinctions? And there's a recognition of how the two dominations, that is the domination of nature and the domination of women and how that intersect, is about the impoverishment of women and the impoverishment of the land from specifically also a southern perspective. And the influence of an emphasis of indigenous roots, spirituality and religion is also very much focused on from a very southern perspective, uh, which Rutha uh, points out. In my context, if I can make a brief remark just about my context, deforestation means women work walk twice as far each day to gather wood. Drought means women walk twice as far every day in search of water. And pollution means a struggle for clean water and children dying of dehydration. I'm just going to stop myself. Nina, how much time do I have left? You still have two minutes, Tanya. Okay, great. I'm well on time. The dangers, of course, is stereotyping to both ways, saying that a certain region um, uh, regards ecofeminism and womanism and the woman nature connection like this, and another branch, for example, in the South views it like this. And um, I think history does show us that um, what Ruther calls northern ecofeminism was mostly completely unaware of how women from Africa, Asia, and South America are more adversely affected. However, um, she does uh, mention that one must be careful of stereotyping women from the North only as the ones that are always privileged and the ones from the South that are always sort of the victims of all of this. Because she says it takes away from the strength of, of women um, working together in, in these uh, southern contexts as well. And of course, very much, and this is something I would really hope we're going to talk a lot about, what are the positive or the negatives of indigenous, uh, uh, the positive and the negative of our indigenous roots, our religion and our spirituality when it comes to understanding how we view the connection between the oppression of women and the oppression of nature. So I'm going over to my final slide, which is about the questions. What do we need to do if we're setting up an agenda for the 21st century action? First of all, we've seen that we need maybe to rethink, and I'm going to hear from you, of it, renaming the topic of ecofeminism in response to the critique. We think about uh, today uh, queer ecologies, global feminist um, environmental justice, and gender in the environment. And here are my questions, and I will ask uh, our technical support when I'm finished and stop sharing the screen. Maybe some of these questions can remain on the screen or be in the chat function, however works for you. But I will, I've got those questions printed so I can be, I'll be able to, to uh, ask them again. What I think is for me, in terms of this very short introduction about ecofeminism, because it's much broader than I talked about, what I realized when I started reading is how do we go about thinking about this from different contexts? So what does it mean to be an ecofeminist in your context? Is ecofeminism a term you can use or would you propose a different term? Can women from different contexts work together? Can we build bridges? What is the positive and the negative effects of the influence of religion when it comes to the intersection of women and nature? You can make a list and maybe describe. What is good or bad, usable or problematic in our own cultural legacies? What is the relationship between oppression of women and poverty in terms of the ecological uh, challenges we face? What is your understanding of nurturing? Is it the role of all women to nurture? Can this have a positive or a negative impact on women's lives? How does ecofeminist concerns link to the reproductive health concerns of women? 
And then finally, how does your culture and your religion intersect and in understanding your role or contribution to ecological sustainability? So you can hear there's a bunch of information, but I've actually got more questions um, than, than um, real answers at this stage. And, and thank you. That is the end of my introduction. And now I'm going to look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Hello, Tanya and the group. Hi. Yes, my name is James. <laughs> um, I thank you for the presentation and uh, and the topic of uh, ecofeminism. Uh, I, I like the presentation and how you have um, coined and synthesized the, the whole thing. Uh, as you are presenting, I was just I was I was thinking about my country. You you spoke. You brought um, Professor Wangare Madai from Kenya, who was an icon, a global activist, who brought a transformation in in the entire in the country and the entire world. And what I was just um, I was wondering since the the, the death of this woman. Uh, until now, we've not had anybody coming up to stand in the gap. And I could see when when you were presenting something just dropped in my mind. Uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, is it Exodus? The, the life of Moses. And then the mother goes to the, 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 the daughter goes to the, to the, to the river to fetch water. And, and the mother and Moses is in a basket, fluttering, uh, floating on, on water, hidden in the thicket. And this, is, this was not the work of man. It, it, uh, that story alone brings, it, it opened my mind as you are just, as you are presenting, how women are, are connected to nature and how women can preserve life. The story of Moses in the Bible, how Moses was preserved by a woman who innovated, came up with this innovation with a basket, brought this little child, placed on, in the water and was floating. That is how important women can, can contribute to the preservation you could see that in that story of Moses, there is the story of a basket. And this basket is, is, is a, a product of what? It's a product of, of a, 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 what, what is the reeds? Reeds is nature. And, and it's so beautiful. Then we go back to the, the water. This child was meant to drown in the water, but this woman came up with this skillful innovation. How is this story important to us if women can learn from this woman, the mother of Moses and the, the sister of Moses, Miriam, Miriam or who, uh, all together who, who came up with this, there was a problem at that time. And you see, how is this connected to the preservation of, of our nature? If there was no water or if there's no forest where Moses was kept, then the story of Moses would not have been there. So, uh, for example, now I was saying about uh, Wangare Madai in Kenya. When the woman, when Madai died, it's like the whole story of, a, of, of environmental issues in Kenya went off and you could not, it, you can't even hear of any other woman. How can we use this from the theological perspective to bring to the church so that women should rise up and take the forefront to preserve the earth? So that this same earth can become a preservative to human life. This is very important uh, to your, your presentation as, as you are 
trying to bring us the, the synthesis or the, the genesis as it develops until where we are today. Where women, where can women stand? Uh, so basically, I, I was, I wanted to see if there is something maybe you can contribute on this uh, story of Moses, uh, water and the bush and how all these, there was no man present there, but this is just women bringing life. And at the end of the day, Moses becomes a deliverer to the entire nation of Israel. And that is how, maybe if we can take from this story and build again, just like the way we have had other women icons who have done explicitly great to help us. And, and the church can come in, the women in the church can come, can, can come in and help us to join hands in environmental issues. I don't know whether it's the, the question or addition. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, James. Um, okay, so um, it seems to me that Nina has, Ninaku has kept me time very well. So is yeah. it okay for the rest of the guests if I just take questions and open up the discussion or does someone else want to do that on my behalf? I'm just checking if, if I don't see any comments, then I'll try and um, do this. And then if Ninaku, are we supposed to go to, I think, uh, 20? Okay, thanks, Laura. I see your comment. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have got until, we've got about 18 more minutes, but we must use at least, I think, um, about five minutes or 10 minutes to make, a, you know, the five main points that our scribes will give through to um, the report, which is for action. So um, before five or let's say eight minutes before we get to our end, can um, Laura or Anna or Nina just remind me in the chat box so then we can just go over to setting the agenda because that is very much important for me as well. So now that we've got that sorted, so James, let me just reflect on your question and then I would like to open up the floor again or re re reflect on your remark. For me, it's very interesting if, if I hear that you are saying that after Professor um, Matai passed away, nothing has happened. I would be interested to hear from you and from other people who listen to you now in thinking, but why would that be? Was it because she was a strong influence? Was it because other women um, didn't? And when the strong influence was gone, no one else you know, sort of thought about taking up her, her work? Was, there, was it because um, uh, um, she was a woman doing this and then maybe, you know, um, people thought, well, this is a woman's job and uh, men are not going to get involved in this. And you will raise the whole issue of religion. I mean, if we talk about positive um, issues that we get in certain religion scriptures, obviously you raise the one from the Bible, which is uh, from the Christian Bible. There are a lot of um, beautiful stories that we have in the Bible about the strength of women. But one of our previous speakers referred to the Genesis creation narrative. And we know that the Genesis creation narrative from a Christian perspective is many times um, uh, interpreted as um, that women are under the hierarchy of men because they've got certain roles. And it's one thing to say, you know, women has got this role uh, to, to, to nurture but I'm always wondering if this is a positive thing or a negative thing, or is it the same thing at the same time? Because maybe women do have the ability to look and to take care of nature better, maybe. But that cannot become a type of essentialist characteristic to say, but it should only be women's responsibilities. And we must also be careful not to make then the nurturing um, role of women into a gender category in saying, but all women should be nurturers or mothers. And that's why this eco-feminist uh, field and this movement is so fascinating because you've got these broad streams. And that's why I'm interested in different contexts of how religion and, and, and the culture would intersect. And if you say no one after Professor um, Matai passed away took up the work, I'm wondering if it's a cultural thing or a religion thing or a gender thing. And before I give you um, a chance to, to answer that again, I would like to hear from the rest of the audience as well. We are about eight people. And to just, you know, sort of reflect on what James has said 
in terms of why do you think someone else wouldn't have taken this up? Is it a religion aspect? Is it the cultural aspect? What is the important, uh, um, this is a very good example, are we stuck in a way when it comes to ecofeminism? I'd really love to hear what you're thinking. Can I respond to that? Uh, yes, please, because it doesn't seem to me anyone yeah. else has got a hand up or responding at this stage. So I'm, I'm checking the the, the, the the chat box to see if there are comments or hands up, but I'm not seeing. So please, James, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Tanya. Um, uh, it's very uh, interesting uh, to see that in Kenya, um, after the passing on of uh, Professor Awangare, uh, the, the the political atmosphere in Kenya is is more saturated by men. It's dominated a space that is dominated by men. Uh, last year there was uh, there has been a protest all over the Mau Forest, which is the key catch, water catchment area in the whole country and the and the sub-Saharan area the region. The, uh, a half of that forest has been completely destroyed. So uh, the opposition, before it came into the government, stood with Professor Wankale to fight for, for the part of the environment, part of the, the reserve, uh, area reserve. But now when the government, the position was joined to the government, there was nobody now to fight for, to stand in the government whereby until last year there was a clash and there was a massive uh, uh, massacre until even right now there is one group that says we are homeless this land we were given but it's forest it's a water catchment area the professor stood and fought with all her, 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 her energy and she managed to succeed she recovered a number of land that was uh, reclaimed, and then she went and replanted trees. But from that period, she passed on all what she did. Part of it has been depleted again, and that is why we brought a point that why is it? It is a political. Uh, it's a political thing that requires somebody with stamina, with a voice to stand. We have institutions. Mangaliso brought a, a, a topic on Pentecostalism. It is a movement. Pentecostalism is a movement of the spirit. It's people, it's a group that doesn't really care. But within the movement of the Pentecostal, the, 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 the Pentecostal movement, we have the conservative, which is this, comprises of the, the scholars. And this is a group of the scholars are the ones who are trying to make the voice of the art hard, but it's also very minimal or marginal. We have the charismatic, which is the extremist. They say you cannot dialogue with God. God, God is a spirit. What God has determined, nobody can alter. And that is where the problem comes in. It takes us to the point whereby uh, uh, Mangaliso say that we need a, 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 a theology of dialogue, ecumenical dialogue. Within this theology of ecumenical dialogue, women should be presented or present because it, uh, the Pentecostalism, the Pentecostal movement is, is there, is, is, a, is a movement that is growing so fast. And in Kenya, we can say maybe it's 60%. You can't understand this. But the 60% you find is only 1% is informed of the climate or ecological issues. Last week, there was a conference we had here. And then I posted something on a, on a climatical change on, on climate in my, on my Facebook. Some, there were crazy comments. Somebody says, what is this thing you're talking about climate change? Can you explain to us? These are Pentecostals, which means there is a need, great need to bring in the aspect of, of dialogue with creation in the Pentecostal uh, movement. So I think that is it. Uh, 
Yeah. Thank you, James. Um, thank you so much for that. It still sounds to me, and I've seen two other comments in the chat box, so I'm really happy uh, to see the conversation. And um, it seems to me, I'm going to link what you have said now to the two comments that I've seen in, in the chat, um, Cheryl and, and Laura, and I'm going to give them a chance to voice them as well. But it's coming back to, if you say that uh, it's about a political aspect and it's in terms of the Pentecostal movement that's taking place, I'm still wondering what's all the role in women on all of this. And this links to what Cheryl and Laura has said in the chat box in terms of, I want to read Cheryl's comment there, um, in terms of he said that he's curious about the role of men in ecofeminism. And it almost relates to what James is saying, because if a woman ran this movement in Kenya and she passed away, is this something that's stopping other women to do it? Um, should it be the responsibility of men to take this issue up? And this links up very much to how our aspects of culture or religion, because you refer to your know, biblical scriptures and the Pentecostal movement, it, it refers very much to how these things should uh, help us or maybe is stopping us. So Charles said that he's curious about the role of men in ecofeminism. And, um, I mean, it's very interesting to me that the first people that spoke are men here. It's, it's James and Cheryl, and now I'm getting comments from the rest, which is just a sign for me that men have absolutely got a role in ecofeminism. And to answer your question, Cheryl, he also said that can a man be an ecofeminism, ecofeminist? I've got many friends who are feminists because um, they're male friends, because um, being a feminist is about a perspective, it's an about an approach and being part of a movement. And I always say that I think men should be part of this. And this links up to what Laura has said. And maybe, Laura, I would really appreciate it if you just uh, uh, maybe uh, voice your comment and, and tell us that so we can bring this into the discussion. Please, Laura. Um, thank you for giving me the floor. I hope you can hear me well. I can, I can hear you very well. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for your presentation and also for raising um, the question on nurturing and um, what is our understanding of nurturing and the different roles of men and women in there. So um, in my opinion, um, the examples also you gave of if there is um, climate change or global warming, this might mean that, um, for example, women have to walk twice as long to, to find a water source, etc. Those are always connected to the responsibilities of, or the so-called responsibilities of women. So the nurturing aspect, which of course is for children in one aspect, because uh, women are the ones to, to give birth to children. But after that, it can be, as at least in my opinion, a very equal um, relationship between men and women and also planet Earth if everybody's taking care of everybody and everything. So that's basically what I was saying in my comment that it should be the responsibility of both men and women to take care of each other, of children and um, of the planet and the land. Uh, and that was really just one point for discussion also to, to open the floor and see what others think about that. And just to also take up my other responsibility. We have seven more minutes to maybe formulate some uh, action points. Thank you. Time is, thank you, Laura. Time is always flying so quickly when one does this. I mean, um, um, I try to, so, so, so hard to speak really quickly, but um, it's it's one of these things. Once one, one wants to get through a bunch of things, I just want to briefly make a, a response to what Laura has said, and then um, I'm going to open up the floor to let's just uh, put the five points on the table. The thing that Laura has said is, um, for me, the main challenge of ecofeminism at the moment, and that's why I'm asking about this agenda for the 21st century, because as you've seen with my approaches that I set up, the different types of approaches that there are, I must be honest, I find myself much more comfortable in terms of from the eco uh, socio-economic uh, um, approach and the anti-essentialist approach. In other words, I would look at ecofeminism from the perspective of, um, you know, um, 
deconstructing or critiquing, critiquing how the oppression of women and nature is connected, and not the connection itself, but that the oppression takes place. And my critique would personally be, or my approach would be in working on that, deconstructing that, looking how the intersection of race and class and gender intersects to that. Um, so I cannot link up with the eco-feminist approach that is the essentialist approach, which says that because I'm a woman, um, I must automatically take care of the earth. Maybe I might be better suited, but maybe not. Um, in actual fact, Emma Thompson and Laura, we can connect afterwards. I can I can send you the work. Um, two years ago, I actually wrote a whole um, a chapter on the whole issue of of with a woman nature nexus uh, and critique and, and understanding the whole issue of reproductive health, where I critique the whole idea that, uh, you know, women is automatically responsible for this whole issue. So um, I very much agree with you. And that's why I put the different approaches on the table, because this is my context speaking. However, in uh, the rest of uh, uh, the global south, if we want to talk about that, we get a diversity of opinions, but we also get very much the connection between spirituality, indigenous roots, and uh, um, the whole uh, understanding of how women and men, exactly what uh, Charles and you have said, should contribute to this. But the point is, it's very much connected to religion and spirituality. And I'm just wondering, in each of our um, uh, context, if we can deconstruct the intersection of culture and religion enough in a way so that we... Um, if we can deconstruct it enough so that we can, for example, if someone like uh, um, uh, Wangari Matai passes away, that we are able to continue this type of work. My question is, what stands in our way? Is it because we are saying different things? Is it because of our different approaches? Is it because for some people the connection between women and nature and nurturers is a positive thing and for others is it a little bit more problematic? How do we balance these type of things in terms of making room for each other to come together to work? Because as Charles has said, this is indeed everyone's um, responsibility. It's not only the responsibility of women. I argue that very much. And I think from the eco-feminist perspective, I must be honest, reading through the, the, the um, research, it seems to me that eco-feminists at least come together in this regard that it is not automatically a given that women should do this, but because women are at the receiving end of ecological challenges, that, uh, in the, uh, which is caused by um, so many political wealth interests that are driven mostly by powerful men in the other parts of the world, I think um, at least ecofeminists can come together and say, it's not our natural responsibility to do this, but um, we have got better ways to deconstruct this hierarchical way of looking at reality. And maybe we are better equipped to incorporate more people, which includes uh, um, men. And um, thinking, I mean, we haven't even started the conversation of how we're going to think about um, uh, gender queer uh, um, uh, aspects in terms of thinking about this whole uh, protest. How do we protest as a humanity? Uh, maybe women are equipped to lead that, not because it's our duty, but maybe uh, because we have been on the receiving end in a different way and therefore we can make a different type of contribution. But you can hear there's still a lot of thoughts um, that's been required. I'm just seeing here that there's a message from Laura. So um, we have we may take a bit more time if people are happy to take five minutes break. But I think I've basically tried to say um, what I can now in terms of the comments. I see there's another one from Yukiku about unpacking the social complexity of injustice. That's very, very, very important um, in terms of uh, looking at the complexity of, of the different uh, um, societies that we are in and the different types of different contexts uh, relate to one another um, before jumping into the terminology which may give an unwanted uh, prejudice to ecofeminism. I agree with you 100%. And that is, uh, for example, I, I wrote eight pages of notes and I only put a brief bit of that on the screen. And a lot of that is exactly what uh, Yukiko has said. So thank you so much for that. 
So you can hear my voice is going, and um, in an hour's time, I still have to make another presentation. So can I think, uh, can I ask, because I don't want us to take too much uh, from the break from everyone, because I'm very um, strong about health breaks and not taking people's time. Is it possible that we can maybe in the chat function, just each of us, just to help the um, scribes, just name three to four things which we think should be part of an agenda. Because if we open it up for discussion, uh, I see there's not that many people discussing and it seems the chat function works better. So let's take a few minutes and each of you just write your name and three or four points that you think should be part of this eco-feminist agenda. And maybe there are some of the questions that helped you as well, but I will type up a few to start. Laura, will that be okay with you um, as, as a, a way to go forward? Yes, thank you. Please go ahead. Okay. So we're going to have a little bit of silence and typing that, and then when we are finished, we'll just say goodbye.
Laura, if, if I can just ask you while the rest are typing up their notes. Um, so if one is done now, is one free to just leave the session and then join again? Or will we automatically be leaving uh, the year and going back to the main session? Because I know we had to click on different links. How does it work? Um, you may now take your break and then at 12 o'clock we reconvene in the panel discussion the link that you've used before to join the initial session. And I, um, of course I'd be very happy to hear the points of the other uh, participants because I'll be reporting back to the colleagues of the week uh, work stream and they will do a short summary of the points discussed in the um, breakout session. So. I'd be very happy to hear your thoughts. And uh, from my side, the part as secretariat is very happy that uh, Tanya, you were able to join um, this session and gave us a presentation. I'm very keen to know more about your work. And if you don't mind, I'll be in touch via email. <laughs> I would be I would be very happy to to um, talk because I, I want to sit in in some of the sessions in part over the next I think it's the third and the fourth of September, so yes. I will be sitting in some of those aspects. But I will definitely uh, um, send that to you because some some of the things that you've said links up very strong to what I've done in the past. But of course, I wanted to give a little bit broader overview. And of course, I'm actually really struggling to see if ecofeminist, exactly what Yukako has said, in terms of if ecofeminism as a term is a workable term for us. And if we can deconstruct the term enough that it doesn't only refer to ideological things, but actually to real life concerns in different contexts. So that for me would be a very important. So if you would just excuse me, colleagues listening in, I know you're still gonna write in the chat function and maybe Laura, you can just post your email address if you are comfortable with doing that. Um, so they can send you more things. But I did take some photographs of, of, of the chat, so I can send that to you as well. But I just need to go get a little bit of water for my throat because I'm going to speak at 12 o'clock again. So thanks for everyone listening in. Thanks, Laura, Anna, Nina, Cheryl. I see Almut is there, James is there. Thank you for everyone that uh, contributed and listened in, and I look forward to engaging with you on this again. Okay. See you in 10 minutes' time. <laughs>